Hi, another teardown today. This is um, another thermal imaging camera. Again, this is a um, fire brigade type. Uh, it's an earlier generation in terms of technology to the um, unit that I had um, took apart a while ago and fixed. This uses a um, pyroelectric Vidicon tube, handheld format um, with a sort of viewing screen with a sort of designed to wrap around your, your face so you can sort of just look at that and not be distracted by anything else. Um, it's got a visible light camera as well as the thermal imaging camera built in. It's pretty heavy and so you can see it's got the, the um, characteristic circular masked display that you get with uh, Vidicon based cameras. So you can see it's got the um, characteristic circular mask display that you can see with um, Vidicon based cameras. But you can see the image. The image the image looks a bit blurry, I don't know whether that's just the characteristic of this type of um, unit or maybe the um, the focus isn't optimum, but uh, it does seem to work reasonably well. It's yeah, The actual sensitivity is fairly good, but the resolution isn't nearly as good as the, um, the later one that I got. Uh, there's a battery compartment on the bottom. Changes out. This looks like a standard um, battery that's used for two-way two-way radios that they've sort of made their own case for. This is obviously normally meant to sort of slide onto the bottom of a two-way radio but they've made this um, box to hold it. Um, the controls are very similar with just the on-off switch on the bottom. Button on the top to overlay the visible camera over the uh, display and a composite video out. So if you look at the overall construction, this whole thing's made on a chassis so it can just go in as uh, into the case as a single unit. We've got a board on the side a sort of back plane board at the bottom that seems to be connected with uh, turn pin socket pins and on the other side another board some uh, memory there various bits of analog stuff so that this ribbon cable comes from the um, video Vidicon front end some analog stuff here and there's a A to D converter Various bits of discrete HC and AC logic, and some uh, round chips there. Um, some of this, I'm not totally sure why they convert the signal to digital. That maybe they need to do it for scan rate conversion. It could be that um, the Vidicon scan rate is slower than um, normal TV rates because of the thermal mass of the sensor. So they have to resample it to get um, a standard speed video signal to feed into monitors and the external video thing. So. Um, that's probably what that's doing. And uh, on this board we've got quite a lot of analog stuff. There's a bunch of MOSFETs there which I imagine are considering they're right next to the connector for the motor are probably the motor drivers for the uh, that shutter motor. Various other analog stuff which I'm guessing maybe to do with um, the tube drive. And there's an EEPROM here. Now this EEPROM doesn't have code in it. This is actually being used as a lookup table to generate the circular mask on the screen and also the uh, the battery icons. Yeah, looking at this EEPROM you can see it doesn't look like code, there's sort of big chunks of pattern, so um, this is clearly being used as a lookup table. And obviously there's no processor in there either, so it clearly doesn't have code in it. Right, if we just have a quick look at the um, waveforms around this EEPROM, Look at the address lines, we see basically just a symbol counter for example, that's obviously the line count. It's changing on every line as we move up we get the top here, this is the full video frame. Um, and then we just zoomed in on a couple of lines here. So we can see some of the addresses, like there for example are the line addresses. And then if you look at a few others we can actually see these are the addresses across the line. So they basically just set up two counters, uh, one for X and one for Y. And um, this signal here is the mask signal. So if we look, if we start from the top of the frame, we can see the um, this line gradually getting wider, which is the circular mask, and we can see that's generated here. So whenever that's low, it's enabling the um, the mask. So the data in the EEPROM is defining the um, the shape of that mask. Um, the various other pins have seems to have various other waveforms, which I'm guessing are maybe to do with just controlling other aspects of it and also probably generating the on-screen graphics for the outlast and the low battery as well. I'm not totally sure the, the low battery indicator sort of shows different levels like a little bar graph. I'm not sure whether they're using different patterns in the EEPROM, maybe at different addresses or whether they're overlaying that in hardware. It's a bit hard to tell. 
because there's quite a lot of fairly complex waveforms coming out of this EEPROM but they're basically just using the EEPROM as a big lookup table to make it do certain things at um, certain parts of the frame some of it may be to do with controlling the um, yeah, the Vidicon drive as well, I don't know enough about the Vidicons to know um, the intricacies of them but it's, yeah, it's quite a neat neat solution in the, uh, this is sort of the date on this EEPROM is 1997 um, so it was really when um, single chip micros were sort of in their early days and obviously this might be an older design so using an EEPROM just as a sort of simple sequence uh, wasn't too uncommon it was a fairly uh, nice way of um, solving a sort of simple problem without making the logic too complicated not that much on the back of this um, field components here and there capacitors a load of adjustments which I think these are adjusted sort of across the top from here but I'm not sure you know they're actually quite tricky to get out you might need to take the monitor out to adjust that but I'm guessing this is probably all to do with the uh, Vidicon tube stuff well, if we take the metal plate off we can actually now see the tube here you see the uh, the neck of the tube here and then here we've got the scan coils these are coated in this shield now this shield is almost certainly made out of something called mu metal which is a special alloy that's um, designed to shield magnetic fields particularly low frequency magnetic fields um, it used to be very commonly used in um, oscilloscope tubes when they had uh, you know, um, proper CRT based oscilloscopes you'd usually see a mu metal shield around the um, tube and so they're also very commonly used on Vidicon tubes. The other thing is the um, the shutter, the actual motor that drives the shutter is all the way back here and it drives it down this shaft. Now obviously one reason for that is um, just because of physical size but I suspect another reason could be to um, avoid the risk of any magnetic field from the motor affecting the scan geometry of the Vidicon. Um, so with this cable here this goes down into the scan coils but also back to the um, the base of the tube which has also got some um, shielding on it because the uh, the power supplies here there's some shit copper shielding here for the power supply and there's also some additional shielding um, around the back of the tube and there's quite a few bits on the other side of this board um, but it doesn't look like anything hugely interesting and it's I'm not going to take it out it's such a pain so it's got all these um, silicone cables going all over the place I'll have to pull all these out to get it off um, so I'm not going to Delve too far, but it looks like there's some logic chips and stuff, nothing particularly exciting back there. And here on the top, we've got the monitor, and this is the sort of um, thing you'd find on a viewfinder on a, an old camcorder. This this is probably a little bit bigger than a sort of consumer viewfinder, but it's probably the sort of size you might find, might found on a professional um, camera of uh, a couple of decades ago. It's fairly conventional, sort of CRT scan coils. I think this is the uh, main flyback transformer we've got this sort of fairly thick insulated wire coming out the top but then that's going down here into this block which is probably going to be a voltage multiplier just to get the EHT voltage I think these probably use maybe two to three thousand volts or something on the final anode on a little tube like this and there's the circuitry at the bottom but say this stuff is pretty much bog standard this is a monochrome video monitor of course you could uh, if you want you could probably replace that by a nice little LCD one Slightly unusual looking connector they've used here instead of a pin header type thing. It's sort of more of a, an edge connector. I've not seen, not seen anything like that before. Don't quite no. Uh, I suppose maybe it's. Well, it's not really much lower profile than a standard connector. I suppose it's. And it's pr actually it's probably slightly lower profile than a 0.1 inch pitch connector, but it's fairly similar to a 2 mil one. But maybe when this was uh, made, the 2 mil ones weren't that uh, common. And obviously. The nice thing about using 0.1 inch cable is you can use coloured ribbon cable so it helps uh, identify the wires and you can split it out so it's, they've used them quite a lot around here. An interesting detail on here, they haven't bothered using a socket for the tube, they've just got individual pin contacts going on the tube pins and more silicone. There's just tons of silicone all over the place on this thing, just holding all the various bits together. There's a lump there, also just holding this down here. And back here we can actually see the uh, motorised shutter, so this sort of periodically interrupts the um, the view of the sensor because the sensor is, is sensitive to changes in temperature. So uh, turn it on. You should see that spin round. So that is producing a continuous uh, chopping of the um, infrared signal for the sensor. Right, it's got this uh, front assembly off, so you can see this, the lens is mounted on here. This is a pretty standard 
composite video camera board, standard Sony CCD type thing, and off, off the shelf part. And here we can see the uh, the shutter in more detail. So that sort of design sort of that's open, then it gradually sort of closes down and then opens up. I think probably the main reason for this shape is to get a sort of one-to-one -one um, duty cycle on the uh, shutter. Obviously there's this strut here which I'm sure is just for mechanical support. This actually feels like it's um, PCB material, it's quite thin, it's maybe point, perhaps 0.2mm or so um, PCB material and they've uh, glued this piece on there which I'm guessing is just for mechanical balancing so the thing spins smoothly because this is actually sort of nice and quiet. This black and white section, there's an optical sensor here so this will be just to give feedback on the position of the rotor so it gives a pulse every time it rotates. And this is the front of the tube. Um, I think this copper stuff here is probably a shielding around the scanning coils. These tubes, um, assuming they're similar to standard Vidicon tubes, are um, electromagnetically scanned. So there'll be a set of scan coils around there to generate the, um, the beam sweep across the face of the tube. Then up here, this is the um, amplifier for the signal. The um, thing about video, Vidicon tubes is they output a fairly high frequency signal at high impedance so um, the amplifier has to be very close to the front because any stray capacitance will just completely kill the signal and if you look at an old Vidicon um, video camera you'll see exactly the same thing the uh, front end amplifier is right next to the, um, the front target connection that, there's actually a connection from this front ring which is connected to the uh, face of the tube so this will be a high impedance, probably a FET input amplifier that just takes the video signal up to a level at which it can then be sent back to the um, video processing circuitry without being too as worried about stray capacitance. You can see there's just one sort of that thin green wire going straight onto the PCB. And if we fire it up, you can see that uh, spinning around. And there's a little bodge there. So they decided they need a um, a resistor in series of this cap, so they just lifted the cap off and stuck a 0805 resistor in series with it. You see also you notice where that green wire comes on, that green resistor, that's a 10 meg resistor. So again this is all sort of high impedance stuff, so that's maybe a bias resistor or something, but um, needs to be high impedance because the output impedance of the um, tube is very high and so that's almost certainly going to be a FET front end, give a nice high impedance input so it doesn't load down the, um, the tube output and that's going into an LT1223 which is a 100 megahertz bandwidth um, current feedback amplifier so that's going to be doing the, uh, the first, probably the second stage of the amplification after the, um, and the, the FET stage is the front end is probably just a buffer to get the impedance down um, that then gets amplified by this and then um, goes out to the uh, rest of the circuitry. Now this uses the two element lens, this um, front one and then that then hits the second sort of concave lens. These lenses are probably uh, made of germanium with a uh, coating except there are very few materials which are transparent to the uh, long wave infrared. If we look in the front we can see there's um, Sort of germanium window which is probably the front of the uh, sensor and there's this sort of fixed paddle in front I'm not sure whether that's a temperature reference or just something to um, compensate the optic it doesn't seem to move and um, when we turn it on we can see the shutter close up for its, its calibration and it opens up so I don't think that's used as an aperture I think it's probably just a calibration shutter and I'll actually press, the, press this button on there, it's, that actually closes it up again so that's probably either a reset button or a recalibrate button um, on the side. And this is the uh, display, it's um, fairly good sensitivity but it's pretty blurry, I mean it's not a patch on that other camera that I've got, um, I don't know to what extent that's the limitation of the optics or the uh, sensor, I mean it's, the response time is fairly reasonable but the the focus isn't great close up, it's, it's not too bad as it gets further out, but it's a fairly sort of blurry image. Um, you can see there's this graph, battery graphic on here, but also um, if we force the calibration, which it probably does periodically by itself, 
you get this little hourglass symbol um, overlaid and obviously that's another pattern that's going to be um, in the EPROM. Obviously you can clearly see the, uh, the circular mask on that uh, image. And if I uh, press the top button, that, that's now overlaying a, um, an image from the normal light camera over the top of the thermal image because sometimes looking just at thermal image can be a bit confusing so um, obviously there's a slight double image there because of the um, relative alignment of the two uh, cameras so it just shows a sort of composite image and this is the uh, outer shell which is made of fiberglass you can see the texture is probably fairly sort of handmade over a mould and then the edge is uh, machined out to give a sort of clean hole in it. Um, that's just the uh, back end of uh, the fixing to seal it. There's a lens there to expand the field of view of the viewfinder. Um, that one is just from the, uh, the button on the top, which is for switching between the uh, thermal and the um, visible image. But nothing particularly exciting about that. Obviously, fiberglass is quite a sort of tough material, reasonably heat resistant. Something like this. And the lens just goes through there. There's a a ring which feels like um, Teflon that uh, just screws onto the front there and seals it, seals it. So interesting little bit of kit. Um, this is fairly similar to the one that Tesla 500 took apart um, a while ago on YouTube. Uh, this is slightly more modern in that it's all surface mount. It's a bit more compact, um, but it's earlier an earlier generation than the uh, the Fleur one that I had. Um, which had a, a microbolometer sensor, so this one's Vidicon. Um, so it's moderate. I was actually just quite surprised the power consumption was only about an amp when it was running, which, considering it's got a CRT based monitor and a Vidicon tube, is it's not bad really efficiency wise. That's sort of an 8.4 volt battery, so about that 8 watts. So on a good new battery, it would probably do um, close to an hour, um, which for sort of fairly clunky old technology and discrete logic was actually um, sort of fairly impressive. Um, as I is, this one isn't, doesn't perform as well as the newer one. This is probably going to go on eBay fairly soon. Um, but I, I sort of picked it up fairly cheap, but just sort of out of curiosity, wanted to have a look inside it. If you look on, um, if you look on that, you find actually quite a few in this this shape. It's been badged by a few other people, but there's much later versions which are very similar sort of shape and size. But with if you look at the specs, they've got much more modern sensors. So I suspect this is probably one of the first generation in this sort of format. Um, but it's then subsequently been updated with uh, more modern sensors, more modern viewfinders and so on. So I imagine the, um, the more recent ones are probably smaller, lighter and higher resolution than this one. But um, this is a yeah, fairly usable thermal imaging camera. Um, it doesn't do any measurement functions at all. There's no temperature measurement at all on it. But for sort of seeing things in people in the dark, it, it does sort of work, work reasonably well. And it's certainly a lot better than no, not having any, any um, thermal imaging camera.